What do you think? Is it uh, Friday yet? We need to go. It's definitely Friday. <laughs> Dude, it's late on a Friday with the way I'm feeling. Yeah, true. It's Friday. And we have so much partying to do this weekend. Happy Friday. Happy Friday, oh, everyone. I'm so psyched. Party time. Yeah. Well, almost party. Well, I mean, it's, uh, to be honest, I'm not sure if this is the start or the end of the Friday, but this is somewhere on the Friday. It's the start of the, the weekend. weekend. is coming. Yes, yeah. the weekend. I have partying to do. I'm mm. going to go out. I'm going to be social. Things are going to happen. Whoa. I know. It's so unlike Goodness. me. <laughs> oh, it's the weekend. It is the weekend, and this is Crime by the Bar. Welcome. Welcome to Crime by the Bar. Welcome one, welcome all. Mm, I'm Jonathan. I'm Anna. <laughs> so, um, as we mentioned in the all the party thoughts, it's Friday and we're here with our Friday mysteries. Yes, we are. <laughs> it's great. Um, who's worse this week? Do we know? Do we want to discuss it? I think we should discuss it. So... I've um, I've been going back and forward between a lot of crimes this week, mm -hmm. and I've ended on something debatable, let's say, but hopefully interesting. I have an interesting combination of I'm low on everything except for the humanity scale. Okay, but I it's also done in the name of treating people more humanely. I mean, my instinct says you're worse this week. Mine, mm. I also went back and forth in quite a few crimes because I originally decided what I was doing and then I decided to do another one that I'm also quite familiar with and always lump into the same category as the first one. Um, I have no idea what you're talking about. <laughs> I'm going to tell you a little bit about two different crimes. Okay. They're both involving German hackers. Ooh. And they're both involving politics as well. Hey! <laughs> yeah. One involves the KGB. That sounds interesting. It is quite interesting. I'm up for the KGB. And both of them supposedly have the same type of death, even though the circumstances are super suspicious. Oh. Um, but, yeah. What do you reckon? Tricky. So... <laughs> but but you, it sounds like you have murders, right? I, no, officially no. Okay. Mm. Okay, screw it. I'll go first, even though I always do. But I'll go first. Um, um, but, mine partially on the humanity and the quantity, but. But before you go first, mm. I'd like to to read an email. Ooh, yeah. We, we've got an email. We got an email <gasps> from last week's crime, my crime last week. Last week, was it the Peter mystery? Peter Bergman. Or the, oh, mystery. Yeah, from ah. the mystery, from the Peter Bergman mystery. Um, okay. So, guys, ladies, people of the world, if you haven't listened to last week's mystery, go back and listen to it. It's awesome. <laughs> <laughs> no, last week's mystery, um, mine was about a guy who'd used the name Peter Bergman mm -hmm. and uh, had given an address in Vienna and then mysteriously showed up uh, dead on a beach and no one really knew what the deal was. Mm -hmm. And when they checked out the address um, that was listed in Vienna with a 4472 uh, postcode, okay. um, it, it just it didn't pan out and apparently it linked to an empty lot. Whenever I was trying to find it, mm -hmm. I, I couldn't find any record of this address, so I couldn't even work out why they'd said it was an empty lot. Well, yeah. Sarah sent us an email saying that the address does not exist at all in Vienna. So the street name doesn't exist mm -hmm. in Vienna or in Austria um, at, at all. And that the postcode, the 4472 thing, it doesn't... It has also got nothing to do with Vienna. Any postcodes in Vienna... Hmm. Is in the this, wrong format? Or? It's not the wrong format. All postcodes in Vienna begin with a 1. Mm -hmm. Some in the outskirts begin with a 2, but all the postcodes oh. um, within the city uh, proper begin with a 1. And if the postcode did exist, it would be um, about 300 kilometres away. Huh. So I guess she's uh, Austrian because <laughs> she said that... The general consensus is that um, that the guy wasn't Austrian at all, um, and he was unlikely to have been German. And I, I don't know why they say unlikely to have been German, but the general consensus among Austrians is that he was most likely Dutch or Belgian. 
Hmm. And the photo of him was circulated um, within Austria. Hmm. And some internet sleuths, I guess. um, (laughs) I love that word. Ended up doing a few bits and pieces, including looking at how many CNA stores there are throughout um, oh, Dach and Benelux. Right, right, um, the CNA shit. So he, was, he had uh, C&A clothes, mm. but all the labels were cut out. And they keep focusing on, it, on the guy being Dutch, actually, above anywhere else, which is really oh. interesting. Maybe Belgium, maybe Luxembourg. And, yeah, there was a specific missing person. She sent me a link. Um, Dutch guy who was missing... Um, that a lot of people think look really similar to, to Peter Bergman. The family hasn't commented okay. on it at all, which also seems kind of weird. Hmm. Um, and he would be younger than the 55 to 60 years old that Peter Bergman apparently was. But it was also pointed out that he he had advanced stages Medical of cancer. Issues, and yeah, yeah, so it could make him look a lot older than he actually was. Yeah. Um, but I I should update our website with, with the details on that hmm. because it, it's super interesting. Um I, I'm not sure that it, if it is or if it isn't, but it's kind of cool. Um, oh, definitely. And, and like, if you have a uh, match as mentioned on the um, missing person thing, uh, I was, before you mentioned that, my mind went back to what I kind of dismissed as in, oh, people not use the foreigners comment, but uh, there was, was it a bus driver? Mentioning he had a uh, like Eastern European accent. Yeah, he said Eastern European. Yeah. Do you know if CNA has many stores there? Or? I don't have the numbers. I no. have to say, I just went by Sarah's email. Yeah. No, no. It's a good uh, combination, and everything we knew beforehand was pointing towards the um, Swiss, uh, Austrian, Austrian. Sorry, yeah. uh, was pointing towards the Austrian angle. So, um, so that's good. I like. Thanks for writing in. That was yeah. awesome. Um, we do love your corrections. Keep it coming. Um, awesome. Let us know whenever you find something else. Hey. Sounds perfect. Mm. Now, without further ado, <gasps> tell me your story. Oh right, I'm going first. I almost forgot. Mm-hmm. For my story. Yes. We're going to. The People's Republic of China. Yay! Okay, awesome. Mm-hmm. So this is um, well. I I had some issues going back and forth between different crimes this week, uh, considering what you choose and whatnot. Mm-hmm. But I did find something, and it, it was just a basically a rabbit hole going down on articles and information that got me interested. So we're talking China, and. With many points here, there's a lot of dispute of some reports contradicting others and the official statements and contradictory reports, and yeah. it's all a bit in the air. So yeah. let's take it with a grain of salt, but I have a few facts at okay. least. But on the, um, on the claims and speculations, we have a lot of human rights groups are, of course, looking at China yeah. over and all. And several of these claim that uh, currently China basically executes more criminals every year than the rest of the world combined. Wow. So these are, this is both Amnesty and other sources um, that push this because like the exact number of executions in China is almost like a state secret. They are very, they are secretive on some points and they report some things that doesn't always add up. And uh, Amnesty in general estimates that the real number of executions in China is uh, like I've seen the reports year to year on executions globally. Amnesty does keep a pretty tight track on that. Yeah. And for basically every year, uh, China is like, okay, we know at least these many, but we suspect, and it's like several thousands above. Uh, what they have confirmed. Uh, so, yeah, it is tricky to have proper facts here, but hey, that's Amnesty and a lot of other groups or organization claims. Yeah. So, for a bit of history, in 1997, China made lethal injection uh, legal as a form of execution. Ooh. And uh, in conjunction with this, they began to work on some generally related technological innovation to their uh, justice system. Okay. Hmm. Especially back then and up to at least 
2007, I think, uh, the main drug used for the executions was, for, for this long period, only manufactured in Beijing. And that, combined with other factors, made it pretty hard and or expensive to handle like handle death sentences with this new approach yeah. um, and to generally comply with the regular need to transport prisoners to Beijing. Mm -hmm. But they found a solution. I'm concerned. Execution vans. For fuck's sake. Yeah. That's not great. So back when they swapped, they kind of began development and trials of this concept. It was relatively slow. But by 2004, they did place several orders and there was like a big touting of the triumphant high-tech solution to this carrying out death penalties. So yeah, 2004, one of the first criminals to be executed in what they called a mobile execution chamber oh. was Zhang Xichang. Sorry about that. Sorry um, about that who was convicted of a, a double murder and rape. And they basically, like, I've seen specs, especially from this, when they did the first major push and everything, yeah. seen specs and images of the, um, well, buses or vans, depending on your definition. Uh, but they were, ba they were varying in size, but basically complying to the general setup of they had three sections so they had the execution chamber yeah which was in the back with a uh, blacked out windows they had That's seats insane. and a stretcher oh. um and uh, the seats for the uh, court doctor and guards sterilizer for the injection wash basin and basically all the amenities i have a question why would you bother sterilizing the needle for the injection if this is not the first time I've heard this question, but I'm assuming that complies with the general humanitarian compliance on the I'd, basic metal of if you're death doing fan something. Is kind of like... I, I do kind of agree, but at the same time, I can see where regulations for that came off. <laughs> if we're talking in a court system, I don't know. It's totally um, weird. But yeah, that, that was the execution chamber. They also had an observation area in the middle, mm -hmm. uh, which was basically, um, they had a glass window separating it from the execution space, accommodating, I think, up to six people for the first uh, models. And the like official who was in charge of the execution oversaw the entire thing through monitors, and uh, it was all connected through a like, closed circuit communication thing, and they had... Uh, seeing the prisoner and basically giving instructions yeah. over uh, the um, closed system. Uh, and then the driver area, that's just someone driving the bus. In the actual execution area, they had like several cameras mm -hmm. uh, and like closed circuit feeds with television monitoring the executions. This was connected in the front of the van and a recording could be made if so requested or wow. necessary. Uh, some sources, I couldn't find enough uh, like confirmation of this, but some sources say that some executions were also like live streamed to, I don't know, show transparency or something. But That sounds horrible. That was some sources at least. So by the, uh, let's see, uh, I think it was mid-year 2006, at least 40 of these vehicles were out and produced by one company, but wow. possibly more. Uh, so the first makers of this, like the innovators, they said that these vehicles and the injections in general uh, were a civilized alternative to the firing squad, which yeah. are, like China has had the death penalty for a long while. Mm -hmm. They were doing the firing squad, but this was a civilized alternative. And what did I say? Uh, for ending the life of the condemned more quickly, clinically and safely. Uh, and uh, that like tossing aside the firing squads and replacing them with injections was a sign that China promotes human rights now. Uh, this was said by Kang Zhongweng, not sure, um, who was the designer of the first automobile death van. 
uh, where, for instance, uh, Zhang was uh, executed. So this is said to like save money for like the state and um, the local governments, etc., where they would have to otherwise pay a lot of fees to get execution facilities in their prisons or court buildings, or transport prisoners, etc. Uh, the same designer, Kang, said that the fact that prisoners could be executed locally really easily with these vans yeah. would deter others from committing crimes and have more impact than executions carried out elsewhere in Beijing or so. Yeah. He, yeah, and he, I have, he was apparently very talkative in several press sources. I have quotes from like interviews with him talking about how humane it is and how proud he was of the bed. And that was all brilliant. That's horrifying. Kind of, kind of. So I'm fast forwarding a bit. Um, do you but, want to do some gems along the way or are you good? Uh, oh, no, the the bed thing was the one that really stood out to me. Uh, like, um, okay, to actually go back to the quote, uh, I'm most proud of the bed. It was very humane, like an ambulance. And uh, then saying like, oh, no, it's too brutal to just toss someone aboard. But this makes it all very convenient for the criminal and for the guards as well. Because oh, um, convenience is what we need. Oh, yes. Convenience and live streaming, clearly. Mm -hmm. Uh, Pretty much. So having these vans makes the entire process uh, cheaper and more effective, which, okay, I can actually see that. So for this bus, it basically only requires four people uh, to participate in the execution, as opposed to the like trial process having a death row thing and then doing the firing squad thing. Yeah. And uh, after the punishment has been administered, I mm -hmm. guess, uh, the remains of the criminals are typically immediately driven to a crematorium and burned there. Uh, That's before, quite difficult to trace then. Before any relatives or independent witnesses can view the remains. It sounds like quite a convenient way to, um, I mean, facilitate corruption in death penalty cases as well, you'd think. You don't say. <laughs> because, like... <laughs> Wow. Hmm. Is, is this going somewhere? Uh, it is going somewhere. <gasps> really? Because oh, yeah. I'm we like, we, we haven't, like, this attention. is just the background on the high tech death van uh, so functionality thing. Crime. But we are coming closer to the like conspiracy edge of it all. Oh, I'm so excited. Because for a moment, I'm going to pause and jump over to a completely unrelated and different industry. Okay which is hospital care, Oh, specifically organ transplants. Oh, oh, I like this very much. Mm. I like this very much. <laughs> this is this is the stuff that nightmares are made of. Kind of is, kind of is. Uh, so organ transplants are pretty costly for, they have been for a long while, costly for the Chinese. Mm -hmm. And especially since from sources I can see, especially um, the last decade, um, there was a lot of a basically bidding war situation going yeah. where the prices could be hiked up almost like five times uh, the initial price if people were cutting in line yeah. and getting it earlier. But still, even with that pushing up the price for the expedience, um, it has for a long while still been a lot cheaper to have an organ transplant in China compared to other developed countries. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I, I have some, most of my numbers are either from 2006 or 2016. It doesn't matter. There's also the comparison of the black market. But um, in general, I can say that like over the last couple of decades, like patients from Malaysia, Japan, Hong Kong and Singapore have all gone to China basically for transplants to make it quick, easy, and a bit cheaper. That's kind of scary. I I did find one. It it was very sad, but still very illuminating. Um, uh, interview with it wasn't someone who wanted to be anonymous, and I can see why. Yeah. Uh, it was a transplant recipient. It was a Canadian. Yeah. Who, like, he needed a uh, kidney transplant. Yeah. And 
he was pretty old. He had a rare blood type. And like, even though Canadian healthcare is pretty good on the cost wise. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, I think, one of the closest to the UK. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. It was pretty good. But the waiting list was like, no, there was no way he would survive long enough to get to the top of the waiting list. Yeah. So he was kind of, as he said it in the interview, he was kind of, um, he was kind of convinced by family members to like, no, 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 look at this, go to China, try it out. Yeah. And uh, so he went to Beijing in 2006. Within one week, he received a new kidney. That's insane. That is an insanely short amount, especially if you're not in the system before that. And if you're, you've got a rare blood type. Mm-hmm. Uh. Pretty much. Um, in this, uh, so this was 2006, he said that he paid $10,000 for the transplant. Yeah. Which is, you yeah, know, for that pretty waiting cheap. time, <laughs> it's yeah pretty manageable. Um, but, but yeah, I've, I found a lot of stories like that, but... Um, even without direct statements, there was enough weirdness to cause a lot of suspicions internationally. A lot of people and organizations were suspecting that this new execution van concept yeah. might possibly be linked to the booming organ transplant hospital care industry yeah. that they saw. So. There has been a lot of back and forth. So in 2005, through reports, Chinese officials admitted that they had harvested organs from prisoners, but they promised to reform the practice. Um, and basically, as a response to this, in 2006, the Ministry of Health like issued regulations uh, banning sales of organs and tightening, um, uh, tightening the approval standards, and they were cracking down on it. And they did arrest several doctors for allegedly carrying out illegal transplants at private clinics, everything, though. But this was all according to the local authorities and state media. Yeah. But e even so, like, even after all this amnesty... Uh, said in a report that the same year, 2006, that huge profits from the sales of prisoners organs might be one of the reasons, at least, while China is very adamantly not getting rid of the death penalty. Fine. Y yeah. <laughs> like, what can you say? Yeah. And what I'm not even say? getting into the uh, whole, the, there is a big mess of a lot of people reporting and claiming but this has been way too unsubstantial for me to bring up here but there's a lot of talk of like the kind of people that are imprisoned and sentenced to death uh, be it political or religious uh, dissidents and whatnot but not I, poking there i always love that quote of um in a similar vein treason is simply a matter of dates Whenever it comes oh, to, isn't that nice? That's clever. Yeah, I like it. I've never heard that. Where's that from? I think it's from Count of Monte Cristo. Hmm. Because um, okay, then I have heard it. I just forgot it, but um, <clears throat> maybe I'm misquoting it. But it's. Uh, I think they definitely said it in the movie. Um, I really like your version, regardless. So I'll roll with that. <laughs> but it it was. Um, Essentially, Dantes was sent to prison because he was loyal to uh, Napoleon instead mm. of the king. But then the king um, lost power and Bonaparte was, was back in. Mm. And, um, and they still wouldn't release him from prison. And they petitioned to have him released because, hey, yeah. you know, this isn't treasonous anymore. Why would he still be in prison? And I think it was the Abbe Bussoni who said uh, treason is simply a matter of dates. So mm -hmm. he was also imprisoned and he was a, a Bonapartist rather than a royalist. That's so weird. Yeah. It is a really good quote. The, the situation kind of reminds me of the um, uh, a thing that is more and more poking up in uh, the USA. Yeah. With, um, you know, more and more states are legalizing uh, marijuana. Yeah. That's... But there are so many people in jail 
yeah. for basically marijuana possession, not even pushing it, but possession. It's also quite interesting because um, there are people who are having their visas rejected going into the States from Canada. I, I don't even understand why they really need a visa because I thought you could, it was more or less free travel, but um, hmm. maybe it's not. Well, anyway, there are issues with visas being rejected to the States if you admit to smoking cannabis, even in a country that's legal. Um, you can still be rejected because federally it's it's still considered an offense. Yeah. So you should never admit to it, apparently. That's weird. Um, but no, the federal thing I've heard of as well with um, like completely uh, like the first, what was it, the first four states or so when they legalized marijuana. Yeah. Uh, and the properly authorized, completely legal basically retailers who weren't allowed to like have bank accounts because it wasn't legal on a state level, a uh, federal level. So, so they basically are a, a huge risk because they need to do everything in cash and they can't, they need to pay all the employees in cash yeah. because they're not allowed to open bank accounts for that company, Ooh. which is ridiculous. That is kind of ridiculous. Mm. Oh shit. Oh, well. Life. Yeah. World. All these things. Hmm. Where was I? Um, China. Yes. People's Republic of China. Um, so, so all of these things like, okay, we have reforms promised and we have um, uh, Amnesty and other organizations not being too on top of that. Yeah. Um, in August 2009, uh, there were reports that approximately 65% of all the transplanted organs in China were from executed prisoners. What percent? 65. Shit. That's a lot. So the health minister, Huang Yifu, sorry again, uh, <laughs> described, the, uh, described in general prisoners as being, quote, not a proper source for organ transplants. But he was also during his career going back and forth a lot on this stance. Uh, so that was 2009. Yeah. In 2013, he basically pushed for utilizing prisoners' organs, saying on record that the uh, prisoners should be allowed to donate organs and that this should be, you know, accepted as a norm in the healthcare system. Which is fine in principle but that's, so up and open to corruption yeah that's the thing like fine if someone wants to sign up for this that's good but that's yeah. not really what we're seeing ever here um in 2007 uh, the same um, minister uh, huang was quoted to say from january 1st 2015 Organ donations from voluntary civilian organ donors have become the only legitimate source of organ transplantations. However, human rights lawyers and journalists are very much digging into this and they are releasing disconcerting reports. Mm -hmm. Basically cross-checking the publicly reported figures uh, from hospitals all across China show a major discrepancy between the official figures and the numbers of transplants carried out throughout the country. I think they quote say the government says the total number of legal transplants is about 10,000 per year. Yeah. But like the report as they were digging into it made the number look more close to 60 thousand to one hundred thousand organs transplanted each year so what does that say about the number of illegal ones yeah it, it doesn't bode well but um yeah the the chinese foreign ministry have commented on these reports saying quote that such stories about forced organ harvesting in china are imaginary and baseless Fair they enough. don't have any actual foundation the main core, especially tying into our high tech thing here, yeah. the mobile execution vehicles are still out there. No one knows exactly how many they are. I got like one number for one province, which was really high, but there are a lot of them and they're just, remember, they like from the outside, they look like normal police vehicles, yeah, yeah. but just like, no, someone needs to get executed. They have the means. That's, that's crazy. That's basically my story. Like, 
I, oh, yeah, I, I had never heard of the whole van slash bus solution. No, me neither. But they've been working on that for a long while. And then finding out about the supposed, because yeah, proof is not easy to come by, but um, the supposed organ harvesting and combining that with what is already, it is widely reported yet again, not going to say that we have any definite evidence, but um, when we're talking like dissidents and like political and religious, yeah. uh, there have been a lot of accusations of a lot of baseless or wrongful execu- uh, arrests and also executions mm-hmm. in China. And then having the very, very convenient vans. And then also a history, by now it's basically a confirmed history of the black market organ dealing. And then, yeah, 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 there is a lot going on here. And um, even though, yeah, it is the government, but I thought this fit the uh, kind of conspiracy notion we were talking about. Yeah, it's freaking me out. And one of the things (laughs) that's freaking me out most is years ago I watched a rather questionable TV documentary about people who have organ transplants and um, inherit, if you like, characteristics of the person that they received really? the organ from. Yeah. Huh. And um, I mean, it, it only followed a couple of people and they were really interesting. One of them was a guy who had a heart transplant mm-hmm. and um, there was something very specific in his diet. So we'll, we'll run with this one. Um, he never before would eat fish. He couldn't stand it. He couldn't be around it. Hated the smell. He hated, hated the taste. Everything. Had a heart transplant and then immediately starts craving fish and starts eating it all the time and also wants to be by the sea and everything else. Oh. Um, the person he got the heart from wasn't wasn't uh, shared with him. It's the confidentiality. Mm-hmm. They don't do that. They ended up tracking um, the person down separately. And um, it turned out to be someone who lived by the sea because they'd grown up by the sea and loved the sea and loved fishing and loved fish and loved this. And and there were quite a few of these stories throughout the the documentary that were kind of um, even down to like a guy who had suddenly started playing the piano and was excellent at it and had no um, drive towards you know, going into anything musical before, but picked Hmm. it up after his kidney transplant or whatever else. The strongest connections supposedly were from heart transplants. And as much as I want to believe it's all bullshit, (laughs) it it, it was a very compelling documentary. And you, we don't really know what is within the organ. Like how is a person made up? Where Mm -hmm. does your personality come from? How much of it is in your brain and how much of it is elsewhere? Yeah, but I mean, your DNA is in every cell. Yeah. So. Ah. It's completely... Like, I say this, but I had a similar reaction. Like, uh-huh. especially my immediate response was like, regardless of where my actual stance would land after looking into this, like, hearing with a heart transplant, I was like, ha, huh, okay. And then, like, kidney transplant, I'm like, nah. Yeah, surely not. But I mean, we put so much emphasis on the heart yeah. that you know it doesn't seem that shocking that you could maybe inherit traits from from someone after you after you've had a heart transplant. But Almost. yeah, like you say, if every if every organ has DNA <laughs> in it, what's to say that some of that can't literally bleed out into the body and cause certain things to be picked up? And in that vein, what's freaking me out is. If someone's falsely executed, mm-hmm. oh, who's to say you're not going to be haunted by their organs? <laughs> <laughs> I, I really get where you're going, but I couldn't stop that laugh. No, because, like, I'm the same. Just the I know phrase it sounds haunted by crazy. your organs is a brilliant fucking phrase. But I mean, oh, it's actual blood money. It's really creepy. It really is. It really is. Oh, okay, I'm so glad you went first. Oh yeah, yeah. That was uh, that was my story. I liked it. I, I, I liked it and I hate it. And it's awful. <laughs> uh, we we should put up some photos of the buses though, because like I um I saw some general ones, but they yeah. like I assume they were designed for. They only look like police vehicles, a bit bigger and clunkier. Um, but I did see. Uh, I found one article which basically had basically like a design breakdown. And yeah. um, that was kind of creepy, but uh, it's it's worth looking into. Mm, mm. We should do it. Let's do it. Oh, 
And let's have another cry. Okay. Shall I just launch into it? Well, it's up to you. Do you need a top up or are we good? I can just launch into it. Launch away. Launch okay. away. We're heading to space. Um, or cyberspace. I think I'm going to ask you a question that you can say yes to this time. Oh, please do. Have you heard of Hagbard? H-A-G-B-A-R-D? I believe he's a Viking. No, I'm thinking of Hagar. How do you spell that? Uh, just H A G A R. Hold on, let me. I think that's the cartoon Viking thing. Let me. I'm. I'm so paranoid. I'm pronouncing it incorrectly. <laughs> Is this about a cartoon Viking? It's not about a cartoon Viking. My story. Oh, Hogbard. Okay. Hogbard. Oh, he's in a lot of tales. Goodness. Um. Norse mythology, dude. Hagbard. Yeah. <laughs> um, okay, well, I'll ask you a different question. Have you heard of Carl Koch? Not Carl Otto Koch, who is someone totally different, but um, Carl Koch. He's German. No, I don't think so. Carl Otto Koch is also a German, and he's a guy from the SS, so let's just not talk about him, because this has nothing to do with him. <laughs> uh, well, Carl Koch was also known by his handle... Hagbard. Hmm. So, um, which he took from a, a comic that, let me see. Um, Wait, what was the nationality of the dude? He's German. Um, he's okay. German. He's from Hanover. Because I, I did a quick language check and uh, even though the name is not the same, mm -hmm. the name for the mythological character is the same one that was used for the cartoon character Hagar. Ah, so there is a connection. In Swedish, at yeah. least. Yeah. Well, with this, um, he was actually influenced by uh, something called the Illuminatus Trilogy. Yeah, it was by Robert Anton Wilson and Robert Shea. Uh, basically, there's a character in that called Hagbard Selene, um, whose name came from the Norse mythology dude hmm. that we just talked about yeah yes and this guy Hagbard Selene would um his character essentially was fighting the Illuminati um and this okay. is where Carl Koch's screen name came from Hagbard and as time went on it became pretty clear he did believe the Illuminati was real and mm. um was very into all the conspiracy theories surrounding that um but that maybe speaks to to state of mind more than anything else because it's it's not the only conspiracy theory he bought into. Okay. Um, were there lizard people? Were there what? Lizard people. I don't know. I didn't ah. get that far. I am um, yeah. Carl Koch basically he had a bit of a shitty time. He he was born in 1965, 22nd of July, mm. um, in Hanover. His mom died whenever he was 10 years old from cancer. Um, yeah, it was mm. kind of sad. And it was two years later that his dad moved his girlfriend into the house, which caused all sorts of arguments. Mm. And it wasn't long after that. Like, can you imagine being 12 and it feels quite fresh that your mom's gone and the girlfriend moves in? Like, parents have a right to move on, but it sounded to be like a serious issue. Mm. And then not long after that, his grandmother moved in, which was also a big, massive drama and affected his childhood. Um by 16. So, sorry, just mm -hmm. since I always have difficulties with this, uh, paternal or maternal grandmother? I don't know, actually. Um, I That's I, why you need better language. Well, I pulled <laughs> I pulled it from a German article, so... I've never studied German, so I don't know how they do it, but uh, I probably ranted to you about the um, the perfect Swedish approach, right? Yeah, you did. With the mother, 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 father, 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 and father, mother. Which is super cool. Yeah, it is efficient. Come it, on. I mean, you know exactly what you're talking about. Um, I have no idea. I have absolutely no idea about the grandmother. Okay. I would assume it's the father's mother. No, I don't have it here. Um, yeah, I'm assuming father because I don't find much about his mother after she died. Okay. He... Yeah, he was supposed to be a really calm teenager. He was described as being very intelligent. He always did well in school. Um, he was also really into geology. And um, later he got a job at a quarry and um, was really into collecting rocks and things like that. You know, he seemed he just seemed hmm. quite quiet. Um, but 
from age 16 onwards, he was smoking a lot of hash hmm. and he was also taking sedatives, including Valium. So don't know how much of it was him actually being chill and how much of it was him being Stoned. off his tits. Yeah. Mm. Like, yeah. <laughs> he, yeah. I mean, it's not great. But by 1984, whenever he was 18, his dad died. Um, and in some ways, well, in some ways it was un his undoing, but at the time it actually worked out all right for him because he seemed okay. to have a, a bit of a strange relationship with his father hmm. and um, he got a decent amount of inheritance from him. So he didn't have to work and it's it was around that time that he started getting into hacking. Um, it was in 84. His, dad, his father died in August, but got sick, I think, at the beginning of the oh. year. But he got into hacking um, in 84. Um, That's a bit of a jump, though. Like, to be honest, I almost just on the brief pause mm -hmm. uh, for quite our theme and everything. But yeah. I, I technically knew you had a German hacker. Yeah. But I had issues with just seeing the technically natural but still i haven't really seen a combination between geologists and working in quarries it that, that was his sense. little hobby that was his little I, hobby more than anything else that makes perfect sense i just haven't heard it yeah but then the jump to hacker um i mean he'd always seemed to he was an intelligent kid and he had hmm. experience using computers but it did seem like a pretty abrupt transition into it hmm. um but you got to bear in mind as well this this is like early to mid 80s um hmm. it's not as long as you're computer savvy, you don't have to be super advanced to get into it. So, I mean, 84, as long as he knows, you know, how to educate himself mm. and he's smart enough to pick it up, then he's probably golden. Yeah, true. Um, it was quite difficult to find information on exactly how he got into it, but I know he got into it in 84. By 85, um, there's some debate about whether he started it or whether he was um, just affiliated with it. But um, some reports say he started uh, what became known as Chaos Computer Club, CCC. And hmm. yeah, he ends up at this point adopting the, the name Hagbard full time as his <laughs> uh, name. And he's named his computer, fuck up all caps, as an anagram of first universal cybernetic kinetic ultra micro programmer um which he completely nicked from the whole illuminatus trilogy thing so fuck ump fuck up but there was an m between uh there's the a hyphen oh okay. so it is first universal <laughs> cyberkinetic cybernetic kinetic ultra hyphen micro programmer oh yes the very approved word of ultra micro yeah didn't you know that's a proper word? Ultra micro. Um, <laughs> I will trust you, but okay. It's bullshit. It's total bullshit. And it came <laughs> from a freaking... Yeah, I, I know it's... I, I don't mean anything by calling it a comic book. I'm just calling it a comic book to differentiate it from a regular only text book. Mm. So it came from the Illuminatus trilogy comic books. Hmm. Um, so yeah, he named his computer after that as well. He was super into it, but also he's been smoking a shitload of hash. So he's probably <laughs> quite paranoid at this point. In fact, we have a lot of reports to go into how paranoid he gets about things. Huh. But yeah, so he is involved with the CCC, the computer, the Chaos Computer Club. Um, and he was working with other hackers who were also quite young, like 18, 19, 20 who went by Dob, D-O-B, uh, that was hmm. Dirk Otto Brzezinski. Um, Dirk Otto? Dirk Otto Brzezinski. You know my huh. dad's name is Dirk, by the way. I did not. Yeah, my dad's name it's is Dirk. It's a wonderful name. It has that Scottish dagger feel to it. Uh, um, well, that's spelled differently. My dad is Dirk like the Dutch one, not Dirk like the dagger in your sock. Dirk like the supermarket. Yeah, but it's Dirk. Yeah, it's yeah. the same thing, right? It's no, D-I-R-K. I don't think it's... I think the Scottish dagger is spelled differently, isn't it? I thought it was the same. No, I'm questioning. I don't know, actually. Huh. We'll it's, have to look it up. It's funny, I have Scottish heritage as well. Like, <laughs> my mum's you side... You have all the heritage. Yeah, <laughs> my mum's side would have been Ulster Scots rather than pure Celts. Huh. So, okay. um, yeah. 
Plus, I've got that DNA thing that says I'm everything now, which is super well, exciting. True, true, true. <laughs> but yeah, I'm no. still tempted to do that after you explain it. But yeah, yeah. Oh, I want to do it for Kelfie. I want to know where my cat <laughs> comes from. <laughs> that would actually be really fucking interesting. I don't think they do it. I think they um, should though. But they don't have enough references to like tell where mm. your cat is from. That's why they need to start now. Plus, it's bloody expensive. Mm. She is turning five next month. It could be a really nice birthday present for her. Mm. I have to throw a party. You're invited. What, what, oh, thank you, thank you. Uh, what would be the like the ultimate jackpot of realizing, like, if we're throwing her a party and revealing, like, congratulations, you're sixty five percent human. Oh, fair enough. <laughs> that I, would be disconcerting on several levels. I, but I okay. don't. I don't rank. Uh, nationalities or countries or bloodline by anything other than exciting <laughs> and, true, true. and I don't that's, even rank them by exciting I yeah what would be the jackpot for her I think it would be super cool to find out she was um, from the Antarctic or something that would be really interesting Aww. or maybe Australian can you imagine if she was Australian they don't even have cats in Australia they have some weird marsupial no, they, they've equivalent they've never had cats exactly have they? that is the yeah. jackpot then I if if it came back that she was Australian <laughs> that would be amazing she was like the descendant of the one single cat in Australia and once the humans started shipping prisoners there they were like no fuck this shit we're going to the UK we will swim we will swim to the UK <laughs> and then it's like we've done it once we're never doing it again <laughs> she is the uh, the Adam the Adam of uh, cats in Australia hmm yeah, yeah. I, I can see that. There we go. I've decided. Um, okay, we're back to it. Computer Chaos Club. Chaos Computer Club. Um, Hagbard worked with DOB, Dirk Otto Brzezinski. Uh, Pengo, who is Hans Heinrich Hubner. Um, and Ermel, or Mark Hess. So you have DOB, you have Pengo, and you have Ermel, hmm. as well as Hagbard himself. Um, now, this is where it starts to get super interesting. Despite him um, chilling out, liking his rocks, like, not just dodgy <laughs> shit, um, but, like, he's into geology. He likes rocks. He's collecting them. He actually doesn't need to have a job. No judgment here. Um, not only that, within... Uh, so his father had died in 84, same year he starts getting into hacking. Um, 85, he's in this club with these other guys. Um, he also starts getting some free cocaine. So uh, probably not the best if you're already a bit paranoid about stuff. But no, free cocaine, whoop. Um, whoa, 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 okay. Yeah, I so, know, we're jumping again. Kind of a jump. So how does one exactly not to promote any kind of whatnot? He just suddenly got like, oh, and here is the cocaine drawer in some, your freezer that automatically refills. Or Some friends just give him cocaine. It's not like, yeah, not auto-refilling. It, it, you made it sound very, you know, limitless and like, and now he has free it's, cocaine. No, it sounds like it. It sounds yeah. like it. But that is also how drug dealers can get you into highly addictive drugs, right? Well, they give true, you a free true. taster and then all yeah. of a sudden it's like, you know. That's true. Hi, I have to have it. So by 86, he has to buy his own cocaine, which Ah. is actually okay because he has the inheritance money that he's spending on it. Hmm. Um, Well, well, okay. I mean, it's not okay, but if if you're into cocaine, then it's wonderful. (laughs) (laughs) And by all accounts, he was really into the cocaine. I'm sorry. (laughs) You laugh away. Yes, yes. Sorry, sorry. That was very insensitive, but yes. (laughs) Um, So... Woo, cocaine. Um, don't worry, he's still doing the hash and the sedatives. Hey. And he still has fun with his geology stuff. But, yeah, it starts getting super interesting. He starts hacking in to US and other Western computers hmm. and supplying information to the KGB. Oh, really? Just yes. straight off, like... Huh, that that is very interesting, yes. I mean I like it, this. It it all went fairly quickly for him because after his after his dad died, he didn't have to work. He didn't mm. have to go to school. He had the money to be able to do whatever he wanted, and at that point he had an interest in hacking. So he pursued it, and unlike most hackers, he was able to pursue it full time hmm. because 
he didn't have to have a job. Yeah. Um, so he picked it up really, really quickly and got in deep really quickly. And um, I'm a bit unclear about how he ended up in the, the position where he's, you know, hacking uh, Western computers and passing information to the K- KGB. But um, yeah, that that's exactly what happened. And it, it, it looks like his, um, his friends in the um, Chaos Computer Club were doing pretty much the same thing. Um, in fact... On Wikipedia, he's described as being known f- known for being a Cold War hacker. Like, that's his thing. Sorry, I had a revelation. Yeah. Y- you were talking about the CCC before. Mm-hmm. I think you mentioned something else, but I didn't react to the Chaos Computer Club until now, but I have actually heard of them. Yeah. Yes. It's a big deal. Mm-hmm. It's infamous. So... By 87, um, a year after he's been having to pay for his own cocaine, which is a bit of a bummer, um, he decides to come to Amsterdam so um, and gets a shitload of drugs and Mm. is having a a hell of a good time until he's pretty sure someone is following him. Mm. And it freaks him out a lot. And I mean, you'd be freaked out enough if someone was following you, let alone if you are... Yeah. yeah, off your face. <laughs> yeah. Um, it it turns out to be uh, a journalist who um, just wants wants a scoop, and over the next couple of years, he has um, he's. It's not that he's becoming known, but there's an understanding of who's involved in in these hackings and who's passing um, secrets on and uh, passing information to the KGB. So um, it is a little bit uncomfortable. And Mm. if we fast forward um, a little further, the whole way to late 88, early 89, um, he essentially ends up uh, agreeing to give information on what he's been doing in return for immunity. Hmm. So it's it's all going quite quick. Now, to be fair, five years have now passed, so there's been a decent period of yeah, yeah. Um, of him hacking and passing secrets <coughs> on, and he had a good three years of, of getting away with it, and then two of being pretty uh, uncomfortable. Um, <laughs> and he was incredibly paranoid by this time. Now, he had um, gone to rehab and was trying to get himself better, but he'd also had a couple of suicide attempts. And, oh, no. yeah, and... Yeah, he 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 just he was in a bad way, and he'd been through years worth of therapy, which is not covered by. Um, it, maybe it's sometimes covered by insurance, but it, it's not generally covered by insurance, and it definitely wasn't covered by his insurance in Germany mm. at the time. So he went to therapy whenever he was in his late teens and uh, and also early twenties. So even whenever he found out he was going to have to pay for it and it wasn't going to be covered by insurance, he kept going. So, you know, he was interested in getting better and he did see that he had issues to deal with. Mm. I'm, I'm going to kind of skim over all the details and the authorities and the police files and everything else. But essentially, um, there were a lot of concerns about Carl Cox's ties to the KGB. And in the end, yeah, he, he agreed he would testify and um, and give all the information on what he was doing, and yeah, things start moving forward. So, um, by the autumn of 1988, Carl was pretty freaking paranoid and convinced bad stuff was going to happen. Um, and by uh, March 1989, his friend was arrested. Um, so he was pretty much ready to talk. Um, he he ended up uh, discussing in detail what had happened hmm. um, with the KGB, what he had hacked, what he had done. He'd even hacked NASA systems. Um, yeah. yeah, like it was a big deal. Um, huh. And he was spilling the beans. Um, by to, to whom? To the Stasi. Oh. Yeah. Yeesh. Okay. Exactly. Mm. Um, so by the 23rd of May, um, he doesn't return from lunch. Um, at noon, he was contacted by one of his friends. There was no answer. And um, by by four o'clock that day, it was really the word was out that he was missing. His his boss was mm. concerned he hadn't turned um, returned from lunch and his friends were concerned they hadn't heard from him. Um, 
they they checked his apartment they checked places he was likely to be but there was no sign um by the 25th so two days later his friends went to to a lawyer to discuss um fear of of something having happened to him by western yeah. intelligence agencies oh, um and it was surprisingly. yeah and it was just over a week later um that so it was the first of june that his body was found and it was completely charred in a forest completely doused in petrol with a perfect circle on the ground of burned um of burned grass everything else was completely dry oh, the actual burned area was just perfect circle yes Shit. yeah the rest of the ground was totally dry um it was a farmer who actually ended up finding him although the police were on alert um, and I have a statement. I mean, it's it's translated, so um, it is supposed to be a direct quote, but it has been translated. Hmm. Okay, so the farmer said, I do not believe um, it was a suicide. Um, it was so dry out that a match could have burned the whole forest. And there should have been a gallon of gas on him. Um, the other thing was, it, yeah, it was a perfect circle, which means... He didn't move while he was burning because there mm. should have been drips from the gasoline. Yeah, yeah. Um, so he seemed to be perfectly still. Um, I mean, they must have made like a proper bonfire, like cording it off, well, cording it off, like separating with like rocks or whatever, making a proper fire area. If yeah. it was that dry, that's yeah, weird. But, but yeah, it wasn't. Um, but that that is more or less the story um the the case was reopened a couple of times and every time it's been closed as um a death by suicide hmm. they are still saying this is a death by suicide um there's some uh, most most people say it's not even though he did have previous um suicide attempts but yeah it doesn't quite add up. He was getting help. He hadn't had a, a, you know, he was also dealing with, you know, if you're paranoid that you're going to get caught mm. and then you go to the police and you get immunity, then you're going to be a lot less paranoid about being caught because it doesn't matter anymore. Also, he was put into pr protective custody, like, I think a day, really? two days before. Yeah. Okay. Um, he went missing. Yeah, the the state put him up and a friend helped him move in and the friend said that, yeah, he, he wasn't in the best of moods about the whole thing, but um, but it wasn't that he was paranoid, it was that he was pissed off that he was having to move house. Oh. And all of a sudden he shows up dead. Yeah. And it also seems super strange that he's... Well, w what's the deal with the shoes thing? Like, mm. shoes are missing, shoes are never found. But also, you don't burn to death and stay completely still. Who does that? If you're not a, it requires a lot of self-discipline to choose and succeed with a, let's say, a clean um, death by suicide with burning involved. Yeah. And, and this does not quite fit the profile. No. And the other thing is, it doesn't explain the circle around him yeah. and it doesn't explain why um, it was described as uh, having been dry for over a week. Hmm. So the farmer himself was super skeptical and, and just, he just said it wasn't possible. It really wasn't possible. And a lot so, of locals said the same thing. The area was dry. It's in the middle of a forest. Yeah. The grass would have gone up. The trees would have gone up. Like. Yeah. Anything besides a perfect circle. No, I mean, unless he, if we're working the death by suicide angle, uh -huh. if he set up basically a, um, no, not enshrining, but basically cutting off, making like a campfire cut off with rocks and stuff like that. Yeah. And We'd then doing it. it. But yeah, then you would find the rest. Yeah. yeah. There was um, a really awesome episode of CSI at one point where this guy, was it CSI? Ooh. Oh, no, it was a riddle. Um, the riddle goes something like this. Um, a man is found in a barn. He's dead from hanging. The rope is... Um, six feet from the ceiling he is he's 10 feet from either side of the barn from any side of the barn and he's 10 feet above the ground how did he get there 
six feet from the ceiling, ten feet from the ground. The the measurements feet aren't feet is tricky, but yeah, yeah. The, the measurements aren't important, but essentially it's the guy more or less is hovering there. There's no sign of a ladder, there's no sign of anything. What happened? Um and the weight pushy thing? No. The conclu because there the scene is as it is, no one else was in there. Um No, 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 I'm just thinking of the um like if you have a counterbalance that is overbalanced, more weight, which you can push off something but, and then but there it is falls no in. weight. Oh, okay. We would see it. I did not know that. There's nothing else in the barn. Okay. Other than a puddle. No caps. Oh nothing. a puddle. Uh huh. Standing on an ice block or Yes, okay. exactly. And I, I love that one. I didn't I just, have the puddle, sorry. <laughs> um well I didn't say the puddle. But like the idea of making it look like something it's not by doing the the mm. ice block thing. Yeah, the CSI yeah. episode was someone got stabbed with part of an ice sculpture, so there was no murder weapon. Hmm. And they went back and they it was CSI Miami. And then they uh went, Look at this photo of this ice sculpture and then this was missing later on in the party. And uh yeah, that was it. But um yeah, there there are a lot of theories about who might be responsible. It could be um the KGB to put off other hackers from speaking. Um there was also speculation that um it could have been Western forces who were getting revenge, but it doesn't make much sense because he's not spilling the beans. But there could be still like a setting an example thing. Yeah. yeah. Um, but surely you're better off having a turncoat hacker than True, a, true. Yeah. But it's 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 really crazy. Um it's usually discussed hand in hand with another case, which was the one I was originally going to do. Oh. Um the case of Boris uh, I, d- I don't know how to pronounce his surname. Floricic, F-L-O-R-I-C-I-C. It's also German. So he's also a German hacker. Oh, German, um, I have no context for it. Yeah. Um, he, I'll, I'll give you the highlights reel. Um, he was known as Tron. Mm-hmm. Um, that was his handle. And he essentially um, was... At the time, uh, Germany's most famous hacker, he um, huh. cracked the whole uh, pay TV encryption thing. So if you have, <laughs> you, you know what it is? Yeah. Yes. So he hacked those cards so you could use them and, and just top them up with fake money that didn't really exist. Huh. Um, and he he could do the same thing with cloning or recharging uh, telephone, long distance cards hmm. and almost any other payment card he could work out how to do it so um there were, were there were the prepaid credit cards that were super popular around the late 90s i think he could do it with those as well um and a company actually reached out to him uh to work for him and uh see if 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 he could um work as a kind of security ambassador for oh, them and yeah, see if yeah. he, he could come up with um yeah. some interesting technology to to stop people being able to crack it yeah The short version is a week after he declined uh, work for one of these companies. Um, So 17th of October, he had lunch with his mum, who he lived with. Um, That was about one in the afternoon. He met with an acquaintance around two. Um, They they had a chat and um, then he went off at around 2.30 and uh, took some money out of an ATM. Um, He was really reliable followed a schedule like if he said he was going to be somewhere he was Mm -hmm. um so his mum started to worry whenever he didn't come home that night his friends hadn't seen him no one knew where he was um they tried to report him missing but the police um had a pretty strict policy and you have to be missing for 48 hours as an adult um when his friends noticed his his mobile phone was still on um, they tried to get hold of the provider to find out where the phone was, but the provider refused to give out the information. Um, however, they did save the location data for the police. So, you know, actually, they did oh, a pretty good job. Okay, that's more than I expected. That's yeah, good. me too. Um, his friends kept calling the phone, calling, 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 hoping and walking around the area in the hopes that they would find him or hear the phone. Nothing. Hmm. Um, and by 11 o'clock that night, the phone had gone dead. Um, after the 48 hours, the parents finally were able to lodge a, a missing persons report and his friends were trying to make it clear to the police, this guy is a big deal. Like people might want to harm him. Mm. Like he does. Yeah, he's a big deal. He does some pretty interesting stuff in the field. Um, police seem to not really get it and thought they were just being your typical concerned friends are made is really cool. Um, so apparently totally dismissed it 
Um, so this all happened on the 19th of October um, after his disappearance on the 17th. Um, finally, on the 20th, the police started actually investigating it. They went through the house. Um, they actually ended up um, confiscating a lot of his computers. Hmm. And by the 22nd, so five days later, um, at five at night, well, evening, his body was found hanging from a tree. Um, it was, really? yeah, behind a local youth center. Um, there's some interesting things in this. Um, initially, the police said that he died uh, one to two days before, even though he'd been missing for five days. Hmm. Um, however, the stomach contents matched the meal his mother had fed him for lunch the day he disappeared. Oh. So um, his mother offered many, many times to um, to recreate the meal um, to, to see if it was an exact match because it yeah, just yeah. made sense on the description. Mm-hmm. They refused. They said, don't bother. They never tested it against it. So we, we don't have 100% <sighs> confirmation that it was the same, but it's <sighs> likely the same. There were some witnesses that said he was, Tron was in a bar with a couple of strangers um, at around four o'clock the day he disappeared. Um, There are descriptions of these guys um, and they also saw him getting into a car with a foreign license plate. Um, There are a whole bunch of different things on that and theories on that and very specific accusations on that, Mm. which are all over the internet and quite interesting. But (laughs) at the end of the day, they're mostly unfounded. Okay. But, yeah, I think the the creepiest thing for me was um, the belt w- that he had um, had been found around his neck. The one, well, the the weapon, if you like. Yeah. Um, it was just written off as his personal property and returned to his parents, but it wasn't his belt. They had never seen it? Not only that, it didn't fit his waist. Oh. And... I'm going to guess that no one tested that? Or? No. Yeah, yeah. No one tested it. Um, the parents were really insistent that they wanted DNA analysis done on it, but um, the request was totally denied. And okay, it's possible that maybe they returned the wrong piece of evidence, but the whole thing just seems dodgy as anything. Um, it really does. Yeah. He also still had the, the money on him that he took out from the ATM. None of that seemed to be gone. Um, mm. And it was quite a lot of money he took out. And if we go back to the police timeline of he'd been dead for one to two days, um, kids from the youth centre had said they'd been playing back there and, and they hadn't seen him. So they hadn't seen anything. Huh. Um, but that's... Yeah, the, okay, okay. The final thing is his feet were touching the ground. Really? Not flat on the ground, but they were touching the ground, which is, you know, pretty pretty Enough bad sign. to be told... Um, I don't know. They were touching the ground. Wow. Yeah. Um, So there are quite a few theories on it. Um, Again, the the death is listed as uh, a suicide and and it was also looked at several times over the years and every time they've come back to suicide. Hmm. But yeah, there, there are a lot of different motives that we could suggest for people who would want him dead. Um, you know, the, the company that had asked him if he wanted a job had given him uh, access to, well, to their technology to see, you know, do you want the job with us? Mm-hmm. And he turned it down a week before. But there's also, um, you know, all, all the companies that he'd pissed off over the years by um, being very, yeah. very public about this stuff being hackable. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, there is no conclusion to it. That is really it. I mean, we can... We can dip into the rest of it. The The cell phone data, by the way, the location stuff, didn't go anywhere. He was more or less in the same area the whole time. There aren't that many cell towers. So um, all we know is his phone was more or less in the area he was found and the area that uh, his mum is based. And to be completely honest, throughout this story, I haven't gotten the... Uh I, I haven't gotten that much trust in the uh, general investigation here. Yeah. Um, yeah. Considering the things they just dropped. So. I mean, this guy, the easiest place to find research on him is anywhere that talks about the conspiracy theories. Yeah. So you can take most of this with, with a bit of a pinch of salt, but the whole thing does sound dodgy as anything. And mm-hmm. I don't know how you can explain the, the belt issue without yeah. admitting to returning the wrong evidence. 
rather than but e- even that but like the refusal to actually investigate several possibly very determining leads like yeah. the stomach content and everything that's that that is weird and a bit shady well they analyzed it against um reference slides that's my understanding of it hmm. so they can say right the guy had uh potatoes and green beans and this and that um but we're we're not bothering any further and you can go into some serious detail there mm. but again maybe it's down to budget but it just seems really suspicious it really does and also the the time of death thing how do you screw that up it's yeah. either 5 days or it's or it's a day or so like it's not one would think it would be easy to distinguish yeah even then yeah but then again if the only oh. thing pointing to um to it being him having died almost immediately is him not contacting anyone and the stomach contents being more or less the same. Maybe he just liked that kind of food. Maybe he just was out of contact. It's weird that he stayed in the area though. The kids as well. The kids said that he wasn't there. There was nothing there. Yeah. How do you sneak a body in behind there as well? It's bizarre. Hmm. But yeah, I, that was originally the one I was going to do. And then I, became a bit more interested in Carl Koch at a certain point, but... But now we got both. Now we got both. Mm-hmm. There we go. That's good. Well, That's a wonderful bonus for this wonderful Friday. Yeah. I think on that note, you know, weekend started, the party started. Well, the weekend started, at least. That's true. It's um, time for weekend and possibly parties. Um, let's go off and enjoy ourselves. I, I think we should. Yeah, I think like, it's time. I, I still have questions, but... Oh, what not, are your questions? No, 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 not specific enough ones. Like, it's just the... There are so many... Things. Floppy points and things. Yeah. And, yeah, but that's also the point of the Friday mystery. Yep. Yeah, yeah. No, I, I think we should enjoy the um, weekend and try to move forward. Yeah. For sure. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you all for listening. And um, I really have always this urge to say tune in, but... Um, yeah, say tune in. Okay, thank you for tuning in. Ah. There we go. And we hope you have a brilliant weekend. If you have any theories or thoughts or requests or questions, just reach out to us on either on Twitter at Crime by the Bar. Um, or you can email us crimebythebar at gmail.com. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, and keep listening, keep subscribing and reviewing and rating, and we love you. Um, we think you're great. Yeah. I, yeah. Oh, we think you're really <laughs> great. Um, thanks so much for, for listening, and we hope you have an awesome weekend, and we will catch you next week. Indeed. Bye. Bye. noticed but i have no idea why i got so ridiculously drunk right now are you drunk i'm so drunk. you started getting really tr- tongue-tied and it was super funny well we're sending <laughs> well, not you for me but yes <laughs> i mean the the ring on your nose is a bit a bit unusual well i mean that was that's you need to stop drinking put it down good i'm telling you about the farmer <laughs> Tell me about the farmer okay. and the weirdness. <laughs>